got any slides coming through. So I think what we want to try and do, I guess it is easier for the data group to kind of say, right, we're going to have measurable things that we're going to do in our MS population, but I guess are there any things that you're doing now in your clinics that you think take into account the some of the risk factors that we've talked about that may be causing worse outcomes? So some people may already be doing this in, in their services. Anybody doing anything around comorbidities or smoking or obesity? No. I mean, do we ask people if they smoke when we see them in the MS clinic? And do we say to people, or what, what do people say to people about smoking in the context of MS? Tell very Yeah, exactly. So do you know what? I think people think that smoking, you know, everyone knows about lung cancer and, you know, you look at your cigarette packets and you'll get pictures of lung cancer and tongue cancer and, you know, cardiovascular risk. But I don't know that a lot of MS patients think about it actually affecting the brain and that it is linked to progression of, of MS. And so I think that's one of the things I've started to change doing when I'm talking to people about smoking is about the impact on your beautiful brain in a way, you know, that actually it's so important for people with MS to stop smoking. And so, you know, I think in terms of really straightforward measurable outcomes, you know, if one of the things was that we were going to think about asking people with MS who smoke, and then actually knowing something about what smoking cessation services there are, you know, because I think as you said, you know, what, what was your quote about the um, person with obesity when their GP tells them to lose weight, they gain two kilos. So, you know, I'm not saying that we're necessarily the best people to advise on smoking cessation, but we can certainly find out about it. Um, so, do you want to? No, no, no. I mean, this is kind of the slot there, just to get a slide presentation. This is the last. Uh, slide of the thing. Because one of the things we, that worries me the most about this initiative is everything we're doing upstairs and, and other things is going to leave people behind. It's going to make inequality worse. Um, because you know, some of the things we were talking about, and you, you, know, how, you know, how do you engage with the community and make them partners? The people who don't engage, who aren't partners, are the ones that are going to be left behind. And so uh, I suspect we will be widening. Um, uh, inequality by trying to improve services, we, we, particularly like around self-management, for example. So what, the reason why we've got this work stream is to prevent that from happening. Is it, what can we embed into this service transformation where we don't leave people behind? One of the things that Marmot came up with in the review, so the Marmot, Michael Marmot wrote the, the health, last health inequalities major document, mm -hmm. and he <coughs> said that if you work with people in the middle, you'll pull people up. So there's something about, so he, he did not think it was going to widen the gap, but and there is an argument in there that says that if we can, we don't aim for the people at the top, we aim for the people in the middle, and you'll get movement upwards. Um, and I don't know whether people think that that is the case, but he obviously found some evidence for that. So who in this room has got um, services that are configured to reducing the social determinants of health or addressing them? frowning in the back and so what's your situation? Me, yeah. I'd like to think that I I take care of those that are less less educated and because I my my group of patients is in Hastings and so we have a lot of social deprivation. So um, I try to make sure my service is is tailored to everybody's needs, but I, I don't think I achieve that in time, no. Do you have, do you, does anybody know, because that, that, we don't really do this routinely, how, but, I mean, how do we measure this in, in general practice? David, in, in Sheffield, how do you measure or incorporate social deprivation into your clinical practice? Because I don't do it routinely. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I agree, and I, I, I have the same concern as you, but actually as you make the service better, you, 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 you enable those people who are you understand how the NHS works and they have to navigate healthcare. You create you create a two-tier system, you create a system for them and a system for those. We, we're aware of this. We have we have a, 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 
very, very high levels of socioeconomic deprivation in some of our wards. Um, done a few things with community clinics and with home visits, but, but, but they're difficult to do, and we're not. Um, the, the incentives aren't there, the, the tariff doesn't reward you for doing those sorts of things, it rewards you for seeing lots of patients with fairly um, complex health needs. But I think we probably need to do more. Anybody got some suggestions how you, because we just assume the NHS gets to everybody, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. We just assume our MS services get to everybody, but it, uh, uh, no, it doesn't. I notice when, because we still do home visits in Colchester, yeah. a lot of centres don't, but my support nurse left, and that was one of the things where I had to think, well, what, I can't keep doing everything, and unfortunately I did stop for a little while, and, but I rang people up the stairs and said, if I can't make the home visits, is there anything going on at the moment that you need? Yeah, and, and I think the problem that, that we're all seeing in MS services at the moment is this kind of almost shift of a lot of our attention to the relapsing, remitting, treated yeah. population. And I think in a way we may even be in a worse position now than we were before when actually a, a lot of MS nurses were very involved in looking after people with progressive MS or maybe hard to reach people by going out to do home, home visits, whatever, whatever type of MS you have. But now so much of our focus is switched really, hasn't it, to that relapsing, remitting population. And it's also about, we, if it's a new patient, we have a matter of time, a recommended amount of time to see that patient within. Yeah. You know, I had a gentleman the other day, I didn't, all my clinics in um, Harwich were full, and he was a Harwich gentleman, so I thought, well, I need to see him, so I'll bring him to Colchester. He spent £8 and taxi to get there and back. Yeah. And I didn't know that. If I'd have known that, I would have run and said, do you have you got an urgent need at the moment? If not, then I would have seen them in Paris and stopped yeah. Maybe this will help. Maybe this is important about the networks. Mm. Because we link very closely with our community matrons, with mm. our palliative care teams. Mm. And so they might engage with us for the Euro bit, but actually they've got the skills to manage people at home and things like that. But that's because we're in quite a big rural area. Um, uh, where are you from? Devon. Devon, yeah. So, I mean, I, th I, I think that is an issue, is around using the skills of people around us. So, I guess it's not thinking that as MS teams we have to solve everybody's problems, but certainly we can be proactive on, in identifying them. So, because if we're, I think at the moment what tends to happen, um, certainly in our area, is people come to the MS clinic with all of their issues really. So they don't go to see their GP because they feel if they see their GP, the GP either puts everything down to MS um, or the GP panics that it is MS and thinks you need to see your neurologist. And so we all, almost, the way we've kind of specialized as people that have become disengaged from their local GP services, but there's certainly we need that engagement because as you say, people like community matrons are ideally placed to do some of this work around health education and behaviour change. Coming back to you, how many patients, how many people with MS are not in your service? So, we have looked at that. So, I, I've got 920 on my books and I think I've got uh, what I call 120 inactive. Do you know? I'm with you. How many have on your books? <coughs> But you don't know how many are not in your system and in the community as well. We Sarah White did this in uh, our Georges for one borough and they were, they were missing 15% of the patients. And they did it, with, it was basically uh, an audit using the GP coding system mm -hmm. and the people that were on their database and 15% were registered with the GP with MS that weren't in, in the system. I'll probably, you know, that's about the best figure we've got, but I think that needs to be looked at in every, across the country, is how many people are not plugged into the MS services, particularly. That will that, that, be a very uh, good starting point to measure this, uh, these parties and, and to check whether there, there are real differences based on people's uh, socioeconomic status, right? To, to see whether uh, they will have the same access to, to, to DMTs based on their socioeconomic status. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I would just, I wouldn't be surprised if those are the people that have got the most uh, deprivation, right. the least education, that the, the, they're the people that are most likely to socially isolate, etc. I'm just assuming that I don't know that, but I mean, based on how other healthcare systems, uh, other diseases work, um, so, so I mean, that might be a, a, a good thing for people who are running an MS service to try and find out. Now, our service is an example because we like a tertiary referral center. A lot of our patients are out of area. But at the end of the day, we're responsible for three boroughs, and we should look after our three boroughs. I mean, and I think one of the things that could help is the, the mapping stuff that David Rock was showing us in terms of actually all of you in your own areas will know which are the most high areas locally of, of significant deprivation. And if you map out, you know, actually, it was, I thought it was pretty impressive the number of people who did have a comprehensive record of all of their MS patients. But if you map them by postcode, because you'll have everyone's postcode, then actually you could, I mean, the, the, in one area, there shouldn't be very significant differences in prevalence. There will be a bit of difference if there's a high ethnic minority population. But you could look then to see, is that area really underrepresented? Why, why aren't we in Leeds seeing many people from Seacroft? Or do you know? Do you know what I mean? And so let's move on to another thing: is poverty, food poverty. Whether you work in Leeds, how many of your patients have had food poverty? Um, more, more than we think. Um, the other thing, I think, this is a different point. I'm not answering the question like poverty, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think MS MS makes you poor. I, I've, I've been out to see where some of my patients live, one, one reason or another, patients I thought were doing really well, they're in jobs, and you know, I was really, really shocked by how, how they're living and they're struggling, and often they're quite isolated, and, it, and it's, it's from, from the end, so as soon as things start to slip, and things really slip, we, the people we lose tend to be those that are doing really, really well, and you can argue whether we need to chase them up or not. Uh, or, or those are doing really, bad, really badly. Well, we, we all think we have to find them. Well, anyway, I did, just about three weeks ago, one of my patients, um, I asked about her diet, mm -hmm. and she's a tea and toast lady. Yeah, you know, and I did a blog post about it. And then somebody criticised me for food shaming this individual by asking her, uh, you know, in a confrontational way, what she was eating. But she was eating tea and toast because of complicated reasons. But one of them was poverty. You know, all she would eat was. Toast to tea for breakfast, maybe a sandwich at lunchtime, and she was having toast and tea at dinner time. And at least she was using Marmite and, uh, on some of the plate, because it's got some vitamins in it. Because the toast and tea lady syndrome was when they were just using a, a butter and jam from the war era, and they used to get a lot of vitamin deficiencies. So um, it's something I haven't, uh, you know, we don't routinely screen for food poverty in our plants. I suspect it's going up. Because we've got a, I live in quite an affluent part of London, and we've got two food banks on either side of our little section of London, and they're always asking us for food. So you know, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. It must I be the same around the country. The cost is quite important. Now. There's nothing more soul destroying than somebody is trying to work out whether they're <coughs> going to take their antispasticity medication or whether they're going to take their neuropathic pain medication because they can't afford both. And I think that's a really big really <coughs> issue. The prescription costs. Don't the prescription costs get wavered now? If you. No, no. I don't know if the charities are here, but it's still something that should be quite If you're on certain benefits, then you don't have to pay them. Yeah, but not that much. No, they don't have to pay them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes, if you're diabetic, you get free. Yes, you're diabetic. If you're on hyroxid, you get it free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still a real inequality. You have to pay for it. And then, and then I mean, the, the, one, the other thing is transport costs. Mm -hmm. you know, so we can arrange yes. free transport, which we do for some of our more disabled poor patients, but it's not a routine question that we ask them, can they afford to come to clinic? Um, and if they get hospital transport, they have to wait about so long, so then they increase their fatigue and they can come to a hospital appointment and they're whacked out for the next few days and can't do anything for a five minute appointment, or not five minute appointment, but you know what I mean, mm. it's all that effort and, and energy. And car parking as well. Yes. Hospitals. Yes. Hospitals. Yes. So part of, we're, of what we're requiring of people is making them poorer. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think you know, touching on the issue of, of benefits, and one of the things we haven't mentioned is employment, which is really key. You know, and and it's 
if you think about the young onset of, of MS and how quickly people with MS lose their jobs, which often within 10 years of diagnosis, and if you look at a cross-sectional population of people with MS, usually only about 30% are actually employed. And I, I don't think that we're proactive enough to, you know, in, in routinely asking about people's jobs and then um, I've been doing some work with Shift MS around whose role is it. I, it would be interesting to know what you think about that. So whose role is it in the MS team to ask about employment and support people with employment? Yeah, I mean absolutely it is, isn't it? It's all of ours. You know, part of when we would learning medical history taking you would always ask about people's job and it helps you actually just to know more about that person's life it's a link a way in isn't it, to them talking to you about life as it is living with MS um, and then I think what often seems to happen is then we see that person and perhaps no one's talked about it and the next thing is they've lost their job and there's that whole gap in between when we could have actually been proactive at how is it going? What's happening? Are you having difficulties? And then, are the services that we can link into, you know, so are there vocational rehab services? Are there OTs in your area that are skilled in um, talking to employers as well as talking to the person with MS? I mean, do you want to talk about the flippant comment in the last uh, session um, on, the, on the patient partnership? Have you went in there? I said when somebody doesn't pitch up to his clinic in the DNA, he just write, writes a nice little letter to the GP and discharges the patient, and that's finished. Doesn't think about that. So does anybody? How many people do that in this room? I mean, some of us do it. You know, we give them second or third appointments, and then we just discharge them back to the GP, and we assume the GP picks it up. You shaking your head? I mean, when you're in a busy clinic, that's what happens. Yeah. People get discharged back to the general practitioners. I write to the patient. Yeah, yeah. I write to the patient and say, it yeah. looks as if you've not come to clinic for your last three appointments. It looks as if it's difficult for you to get to clinic. I've not arranged something routinely, but can you ring our MS coordinator if you would like another appointment, or we can support you? I phone them so that they still have a clinic appointment and then convert it to a phone call. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so I say DNA should be, it's not does not attend, it does need attention. Because yeah. mm -hmm. either you end up in a spiral, it might be that you can't come, and then you don't come, and then you and, and, you and you just then out of the room because something went wrong. Yeah, so what, I mean, one of the things, that, that if we do these service transformation things is, unless we have systems in place, and proactively put them in place, get the DNAs and the people on in the system, then what's going to happen is we're just going to get the cream. Uh, and these people are going to be doing exceptionally well and we're going to get little uh, naughty badges. <coughs> but, you know, underneath this is this, um, this disparity that... Um, and in our, in our area, we actually got a, a bigger issue because we've got a big, big immigrant population where a lot of our patients, some of them don't even speak English, mm -hmm. and they need mainly. And, uh, you know, that's even a much higher risk group because the Bangladeshi will tend to, if you don't speak English, will tend to be arranged marriages and they're completely socially isolated. You know, they're very depressed. It's, that, it's an added issue in, in our part of uh, I assume you've got the same populations in Bradford and Leeds as well, in terms of immigration? Yeah, really high in Bradford. I mean, I think in Bradford now it's probably over 20% yeah, of the population are South Asian. Less so in Leeds, but it's very clustered in different areas in Leeds. So certain areas of Leeds will have really high African Caribbean populations, Indian populations, Bangladesh. Really? What about arranging a community clinic, like close to these areas where the socioeconomic, you know, you know that the population is quite um, poor. Yeah. What yeah. about arranging community clinics in the GP closer by to these areas, so that makes it easier for patients to transfer? There. Yeah, I mean, I th that's what I think we need to just look at much more flexible ways of delivering our services. I mean, we have, um, we run most of our MS clinics actually from one of the poorest areas of Leeds just by chance because there's this sort of hospital there in Seacroft that, that we use. 
but it's still not a great offer for people who do right the other side of Leeds, who then have to spend all day waiting for transport, taking transport. But I think if we have, you know, resource to do that and to go out and do community-based clinics, which aren't just focused on treatments, but are perhaps much more screening about general health and signposting people, I think that would be a really good idea. We, so we run community clinics in Sheffield. We set, we set them up a few years ago, so we, um, Sheffield's quite big, so we, we have four community clinics, just one, one a month in each area, but specifically for that reason, because yeah. the parking at the hospital is so horrendous, and when you give patients the choice, where you know where do you want to see us again? Do you want to see us here? Or, and they always say here, because the parking's better, and, but yeah. they're nurse there rather than a consultant mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So they still need to see the consultant and, and a lot you just of nudge one of your consultants. I do? You just nudge one of your consultants. Some, some, <laughs> some of them aren't seen by consultants, but they're really they're really successful, they've been really successful. Yeah. Do you use any sort of comorbidity screening in those or you know, do you have a kind of structured screening to sort of include these things like smoking yeah. and obesity? We always yeah. question and side post stop smoking classes and I act as a big, the mental health side is a big yeah, one, yeah. so I always ask about that and side post as well, or refer directly. Because yeah. I guess one of the nice things about this meeting as well is, you know, there's often things that some people are doing that others aren't, and it is about learning as well from best practice in different parts, isn't it? So a good thing that I read, I read this is why reading the BMJ is a good thing about what general practitioners do, and they have these high risk registers. Uh, where they have a group of patients on a high risk register. Does anybody uh, have a high risk register of patients? You know, the way we, we actually you proactively find those patients once a week or once every two weeks to make sure they're okay. Nobody does that. That could be a one way of addressing this issue is a high risk. But, but then, you've got to have a, then you've got to have a screening mechanism to put them on the high risk register. What gets them on the high risk register is some of these issues. Your, your primary care, the new primary care networks that have been set up with, under the new integrated care system should could offer an opportunity for local delivery mm -hmm. of services because it doesn't have to be delivered in every mm -hmm. GP surgery. One could take the lead yeah. with support from secondary care to do that. That might offer an opportunity. Yeah. The other thing is the um, what's the payment system in? In, in primary care, you know, oh, the Coif system, oh. isn't it? It, it? What we found when we were doing the NHS England work was that if, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, there's a Coif where you have an annual review and your comorbidities are checked and your medication is checked and actually there's shared care prescribing. And we were like, well, that's what we need for MS. If, if you could actually persuade and it's a, thing it's, it's a, it's a quality, quality outcome frame, framework. framework, and GPs get funded based on that. And so, to me, the fact that rheumatoid arthritis is almost a parallel model for us, and it was taking on board all of that that was saying about comorbidities, but that then everyone with MS would get an annual appointment with their GP where their comorbidities are looked at, but also there's much more sharing around it's um, good, monitoring. It's a, it's a good way to interact with the general practitioners potentially. Uh, can I just ask, does anybody know how many child carers in the MS population? There's hundreds in the country, you know that. Maybe even thousands. So every, every MS centre will have within their cohort of patients um, child carers. And child carers are defined, I don't know what the age is, but they are less than 13 or over. Yeah. 7 to 16. 7 to 16. Does anybody know? I know I know a few in my practice, but I don't know I don't know how many there are. I have no idea how many child carers are going out. The MS Society highlighted this how long ago? The child care one. It was about two or three years ago there was a big campaign about child care. Yeah, we have been able to campaign, we've actually just done a survey of family <coughs> carers to find out how many there are. Because we don't we don't know. Sure. So my one patient that I had to trigger a um, safety alert was a lady whose husband had left her and she was and the reason why I picked it up because she had um, abrasions on the right down the whole spine. And when her child, when her son was in there, he was 13, 14, she used to um, hop down the stairs and then rub the back of the stairs. And really high risk because she was on her own. So 
So we have a high number of elderly carers as well looking after their um, adult children as well. I think they're very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So it's so elderly parents. parents or, and elderly parents, yeah, yeah. Who are looking after their child who is an adult. Mm -hmm. I think they're sometimes forgotten about. See, so yeah, I think I get, in, I, get in the sense, I get in the sense that none of us in this room have configured our services to address some of these social determinants, which are really important. How many pressure sores? Does anybody know how many pressure sores they've had in there? We don't get them anymore because those patients tend not to be in our service anymore. But they are an important quality metric for uh, our patients to be managed. And we've had recently an admission with a uh, big pressure sore. <clears throat> and actually the patient should not have got the pressure sore because the patient had a lot of resources that was changing the company that was providing the carers. <clears throat> And they let this individual get a pressure sore, which is so we don't know enough about that. It's also knowing the care agencies, isn't it? If you don't know, I mean, when I when I was in the previous role, I knew my region and I knew the quality of the care agencies that were running, but now I've changed, I don't know that I don't have that information anymore. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the populations that are, as we said before, that are becoming disadvantaged are the progressive patients. Um, how many centres only see people on treatment or relapsing remitting patients predominantly? Well, home visits have, have been stopped, so in the past year I've now not been allowed to do home visits anymore. Why is that? Because funding, so money. Money from the community? So the trust has told me I'm not allowed to do So the trust paying your salary and they won't allow you to go into the community? So my role was a dual role, so yeah. I was supposed to go out, but now I'm told that I'm not allowed to go out anymore. Mm -hmm. That's really the same question. Mm -hmm. But surely, like, uh, doing the home visit does help keeping patients out of the hospital. I, I mm -hmm. completely and that's, agree. That's a benefit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. So there's all of these issues about knowing the care agencies, knowing about what's going on, seeing, seeing all of the how things work at home and all of that kind of stuff makes a difference and you can stop things happening before it gets worse, but the not able to go out into the community anymore makes your role smaller, but the monitoring, the drug monitoring, that, that yeah. expanding makes it harder to actually, when there's only one of you for a big caseload, yeah. so there's only a certain amount of hours in the day, aren't there, so you have to kind of work out how, yeah. how so to So the, the MS nurse works closest with me, Freya, she spends at least a day a week time once. <clears throat> making sure the PIP forms are, and, and PIP, you know, personal dependent payments are filled in correctly and appealing in the system. Mm -hmm. And she actually physically goes herself to the appeals because often these patients just don't have the education and the resources to, um, to verbalize the arguments to keep their, their benefit payments at a certain level. So that's a big service thing. She's very passionate about it. Yeah. Our um, MS Society, local MS Society, actually pay for a CAD advisor to be available once a week to, CAD advisor. Yeah, mm -hmm. to pay to sort out pay. And it is so valuable. Really it is so valuable. Thank you, MS Society. Yeah. It is incredible. Um, if I just couldn't take that off. No. I mean, not, I, I, I don't know, but are there many community based MS nurses sort of nationally, or, or are most MS nurses still predominantly hospital based? We set it up in Cornwall. Did you? Yeah. Myself, I was there at the very beginning, setting up the service, and I was a bit of both. And then as the DMTs grew over the years, I um, managed to get funding for a community based nurse to do the outreach because you get Cape Cornwall and Truro is quite far up. Yeah. You know, you're looking at 80, 100 mile round trip mm -hmm. for a hospital visit, mm -hmm. physio, campus. So we went out. I guess we outreach in Devon, so I do community clinics once a week in about 12 different places across the region. Oh, right. So we just go where the patient is. Yeah, yeah. That's because mainly you're just using it in the sense of a rural base. Yeah. The population is mainly rural based. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'm not to talk to the managers too much about where I am and what I'm doing. That's the thing, sometimes you keep quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to say that in yeah. Devon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, one of the things you just touched on earlier was alcohol and smoking. Um, does anybody have a specific um, screening program or referral path for 
dealing with addictions? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, I'm stunned when people say to me, I drink a whole bottle of wine every night. Yeah. You know, a small woman, my son. You know what I mean? That's going to be nine units every night. That's um, adding to the poverty. Yeah. 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 There's but, something for me, though, around that, around it's a coping mechanism, it's not a healthy coping mechanism. No, yes, absolutely. So, how do we, uh, so other days you might look at is who lives alone. Yeah. You know, so, yep. uh, Social there are times yeah. when I think I would be quite tempted to drink too many glasses of wine, but somebody else being in the house is a downward pressure yeah. on that. Yeah. Or, you know, the fact that you have a conversation means you don't need to have that. Yeah. So, I think it's something about how we connect people, and we know that social connections have more value even than, uh, and, and it's different in MS, but in terms of smoking and health. Yeah. But we don't pay attention to the social connections. Yeah. So how do we do we identify those people alone so they're almost a risk? Yeah, and that's where it, it's interesting. We were briefly talking about it earlier on, but some of this um, asset-based community development work, which is looking at a community, and instead of us having, it's a, it's a bit like you're turning the language around. So instead of saying. Seacroft in, in Leeds is a really deprived area of Leeds and so you're always thinking about it in a glass half empty way. Actually there's loads of fantastic people that live in Seacroft who can provide support to other, other people and loads of interesting organisations and a community radio station and stuff like that. So looking at it in the other way is what assets does that population have? Um, and there was a project um, of a guy who whittles um, in wood and he um, makes walking sticks. So he got together, um, he was a sort of community link and he got a, a group of isolated men together and they all make sticks now, walking sticks, beautiful, whittling the wood. Um, and it's just an example of kind of, you know, in, in communities there are talents and, and it's a bit like your work you know, is very much based in the practice, but this asset-based work is a really good way of thinking what can be done in that community. So in another area of Leeds, there's a group called MS Chat, which was just set up by one of our um, people with progressive MS, and they just meet on a regular basis. But for that group of people who are predominantly quite, you know, have quite significant disability, they love MS chat, you know, it's a kind of, you know, so I, I don't know if in, in your areas there are any examples of kind of really good community assets that you link people into, or have Men you heard sheds. of that? Is that national? Yes. Men in sheds? Yeah. Men in sheds. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. 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 So we, we've got a coffee. <coughs> What's it called? Coffee. This is just coffee. Coffee. <laughs> 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 Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the day hospices, some of my patients who've been to day hospice and have aromatherapy or a massage at the day hospice, it's fantastic. I mean, I think the problem is, and I think we all need to lobby palliative care services, is that people with neurological conditions just don't get the same access, really, to um, palliative care. Yeah, we've done that in the so we have been we closely with our hospice. So our patients can go for like sessions, and they have sessional time with them. So if we socialise, they just can refer them in, or if they need a bit more physio, we can't just pay They do things like fatigue management as well. So. Yeah. And then also look at, um, looking at their drugs as well, and, and see if they can treat them around. So, and, and also from the uh, workshops we have run at bars in uh, Abu and we have realized that people with MS are very interested in getting involved in the care of other people with MS. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
uh, it's not only about bringing them together to have a coffee, or they, they can also help other people with MS uh, navigate the NHS, or you know, like sharing their experience, their own experience within the system. Mm. I think that's really, really important that people mm. don't want to be helped, they want to help others. Yeah. And one of the practices did this lovely thing where they said, they put a notice up on the reception desk and they said, would you help us to feed the birds? And um, they, were, they gave out um, a bird feeder and then people from the practice champions went out and visited them to fill up the bird feeder. But they weren't being nice, labelled as an isolated, lonely, sad person. Yes. But they thought they were helping back because they were collecting data about the birds that they saw and then they got involved. But I think finding clever, nuanced ways to get people involved. And I was thinking about if people are more likely to lose jobs, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that people want to lose purpose. Yeah, so how yeah. can you involve people who can give a few hours but not work anymore? And yeah. how can you keep that level of involvement longer? Mm -hmm. So just to give you the figures you know, in the MS space, by the time people hit their uh, disability score, three and a half, 50 percent are unemployed. Now, uh, three and a half is, you wouldn't know they were disabled. I mean, by the time they hit a walking stick, it's about, uh, I think it's 85 percent unemployed. It's an incredibly disabling condition, economically, very disabling condition. Can I just bring up something I've uh, observed in Cornwall over there? Like, the Did you, when, you, when you did your training, any pointers that we should all be aware of what we should be looking for? One of the things is, is trying to make sure that women have a safe place to perhaps in the toilet. You can put stickers up while you're being domestically abused. Often we try and get them out to the consultation room. If you need to get a box of tissues or anything like that, mm -hmm. then ask is everything okay at home. Yeah. And it took a long time to dig. Like mine down, find out if there was a problem. But bruises were often exciting. There's, there's, there's yeah. some research papers on this. It's yeah. much more likely to be physically abused if you've got MS. I mean, yeah. it's well, it's actually a. And we don't talk about well it that much. Okay, um, and we've got another half an hour to put together something that we want this work stream to do. I, I, I want to identify most of the, or some of the issues around this particular topic. <clears throat> well, the question is, what can we do as a community <laughs> going forward? More, more home visits. In my personal opinion is we probably need to put in place uh, consciously um, systems to find the people that have fallen out of the system. Number one. Yeah, so that can easily be done by the GP networks. Because the yeah, GPs have got them all on the databases. And I think actually in the way it's actually identifying Frail, because actually frailty tends to be great for all the people, so actually there's no harm in actually saying this person is severely frail for these particular reasons. Yeah. Um, that should be one part of district nursing community review. Mm -hmm. So, is it MS or is it all the processes that person is failing? I think that's the district nursing service anyway. Okay, so the first thing is the screening thing, the screening process. Does anybody have any way, I mean, the most logical way to do it is by the GP community services. Do you have any other ideas? Sorry, Gavin, what do you mean with screening? What do you mean? Finding the patient on your service. Oh, the patient's on the service, yeah. So what I'm trying to say is we yeah. shouldn't just be focusing on senior service. Yeah. 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 Finding yeah. out the yeah. people yeah. that are not in your service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. 
our electronic patient system, which is shared with general practice, flags up the frailty index now, doesn't it, Oliver? Yeah. So actually, you get a flag up, you know, with the MS patient who's frail. Does the, does the frailty score work in MS even though they're younger? Uh, is it weighted to age? Is it weighted more to age and other comorbidities? So maybe we should look into whether or not there's a, a frailty index for MS that's not wage, not age adjusted. It's just what to do with uh, these are falls, uh, yeah. which, is, which is kind of does that as well. But that's actually identifying the high risk patients. Mm -hmm. So does does anybody have any issue of us putting forward at least testing a um, screening tool or uh, an indicator system for high risk patients? This is going to create a world of work for us. Yeah. <laughs> so at the moment, we're just letting it drift over us. Yeah. We know it's there, but it just drifts. So it's like too, 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 much, too much detail to worry about. And I mean, I wonder whether one of the things is do we need to sort of have champions for each area that, you know, from, from here, you know, people who would actually say, yeah, I'd be really happy to look at the frailty indexes and see are they relevant to MS or do we need a small project to, te to test them out or, or how do we geographically identify people? Um, I suppose the high risk register could be addiction, social isolation, uh, maybe depression and suicide we haven't discussed, mm -hmm. that's also massively affected. Actually, mental health has got the best data out there on social determinants affecting outcomes is, is mental health, mainly around depression and, su and suicide. Um, but anxiety is so prevalent mm -hmm. as well, and there's really good data showing that um, your likelihood of starting a DMT is really affected by anxiety, which is kind of logical, but if you think about it, I don't know how you approach it, but if someone is actually turning down a DMT, it can be because they're just so anxious. I can remember one of our patients just saying to me, I cannot bear you to even mention PML, for instance. And it was almost phobic, you know, just I can't even think about that possibility, you know, this, you know and any of these drugs that have those letters attached to it. And, it and, and so some people aren't getting the best treatment because their anxiety isn't well managed, and that's making them... Oh. If I may contribute, uh, what might be quite essential probably is better cognitive monitoring because I mean many of the patients have quite significant cognitive decline and it, it causes problems in relationships. I mean those are young professionals with yeah. young families and so on. So uh, the life can be in pieces very shortly for, for this reason. They don't have to have like physical neurodisability significant but I mean the, the behavior changes completely, sexual behavior, cognitive uh, kind of functions and so on. So it might be quite essential maybe for the support as well. Mm -hmm. you, could, you, could, you, could, you want to say something? Yes, uh, family support is very important as well. Yes, we agree. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that's probably kind of the opposite of social isolation, having the family support. Mm -hmm. Who routinely, because I don't do this, this is making me think about the way I practice, is who routinely screens for social isolation? We're talking about the house. Yeah. Any other disease areas where this is done routinely? I assume that psychiatrists must do this. Cancer care. Cancer care has a really good, where I used to, because I used to be a MAC nurse, so that we had it down pat really for all the social screening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That reminds me, Gavin, of a um, conversation that we had with one of the patients who also had cancer associated with MS and then was recently diagnosed and she said how fabulous it was and she wished that the way that the, I think it was Macmillan in particular, approached the cancer was also possible for MS, so it might be that there are really good things to learn from. It wasn't so Macmillan or something else, one of those houses? It wasn't Macmillan, was it? It, was, it had a different name, I can't remember. It's also one of the breast cancer children. There is a Macmillan holistic needs assessment which 
a lot of patients that come to go through early doors to yeah. pick up all the social aspects yeah, yeah. and actually it would be applicable to this sort yeah. of population as well. I would have thought it would be easy to get access to the review. But I have to say, having worked in both camps, funding and the structure is completely different. I feel, having, you know, when I came into neurology, neurology is not funded in the same way as yeah. oncology. I've had a couple of patients, one who had ovarian cancer and one who had breast cancer, who told me that it was so much easier dealing with cancer than it had been dealing with their MS diagnosis. I mean, part of that was that the oncologists are very like, right, this is what's going to happen in, in, you know, you know, and in five years, this is your percentage and this, and you know, so, that, so um, the uncertainty of MS made it so much more difficult for them. But as you say, the, the funding and support and um, services available. But I mean, I think it's a great idea that we learn from other conditions. And I do think one of the things is following up this idea of quaff for rheumatoid arthritis is quite a... That's what the commission is saying. Yeah, yeah. Who have you talked to about that? Of the treatment, NHS, NHS England, yeah. Probably need to group it as to make it big enough to land with NHS England, you probably have to do it as a neurology package yeah. rather than mm -hmm. just looking at MS. MS probably too sp wouldn't have enough yeah, yeah. financial impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you need to look across the board to sort of say, if we, what are the key things that would be good for all neurology patients? And that's the type of thing. Yeah. You want to find your neurology disability in, in, in the community. So that's a chronic neurology register disorders actually in the community. So I think it's quite big actually, it's getting bigger because when you look at the WHO's um, list of top 10 diseases that cause the biggest economic impact, about four or five of them, neurology is higher, stroke, but dementia, and migraine on the list, believe it or not, even though it's uh, not that disabled. Well, it's not like life threatening. Okay, so um, anything else we should do, or potentially do? We've got to go up there and tell people up in the room upstairs what we're going to do is a work stream. So do you know on your list in a hospital service who is inactive in terms of being no. offended? You don't know that. You haven't got a list of names. We've got a list of names and we may be able to say which ones have not been in there, but we have no idea why they're not back home. So, so that, that, that follow-up is, is well in our hospital. Maybe How would your letters actually actually state what the current diagnosis is and past diagnosis is in this history? Do you just have complete sclerosis or do you have this person has rational committing MS or this person has rational committing MS and then change the second request of MS? Which we tend to, tend, I tend not to put that in more, yeah. let's call it MS, for yeah. a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we need a quick win, and I'm sorry if this is really basic, but I'm just wondering whether I mean, I have a standard template letter that goes out for the newly diagnosed, and I put things in there like diet and things, but now I'm wondering should I have something about smoking? Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering as an academy whether we can just have, so the very, it's not very, it's not all of us trying to write a template. So, yeah. I mean, uh, Agni is doing the lifestyle wellness uh, work stream, which I, kind of overlaps with this, but it's okay. probably a bit different. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at the vulnerable patient. <coughs> But I agree, they got overlap with each other. Um, we definitely need a bit of work on this. Yeah. I was just going to say about sort of principles of screening, it's obviously it has to be something that you can do something about. So now that we've identified it, what can we do? So, so what do, I mean, uh, what do we do with find food food quality? I was going to, was going to uh, say about um, not so much poverty, but re rest can't solve poverty. Rescuing people who fall out of the system. I don't know if I want to talk about the community team that she set up. So we had a, a team that was set up specifically to go and find these people and so And there were lots of iterations, but the most successful seemed to be a psychologist and an OT. Yeah, we yeah. Were, the, were the most sort of we got the most success of bringing bring people back in. Yeah, we got funding from the MS Society, and it was at the time when the MS Society had a couple of buildings, a couple of centres that were closing down but they wanted to reinvest that money in teams so we bid for a community team in Leeds and we chose to have a psychologist and an OT in the team 
Um, and the aim was to find people with advanced MS living in the community, and, and particularly those people who, you know, had had a very bad experience at, at the time of diagnosis, so they'd been sort of, well, their impression, you know, was that they'd been told to go away and live their lives, and they'd actually just not engaged with services again, and also didn't realise that some of the problems that they were having, like the urinary incontinence or spasticity, were actually treatable conditions. So that was very effective. What happened actually, to the team? In, so what happened to the team was, so this was an ethnia, um, this was an MS specific team. And to be fair, actually what it's evolved into is a generic community neurology team. And I'm not too upset about that because it did mean that it's got continued funding but it wouldn't have got continued funding as a specific MS team, but now it is a community neurology team who we have an MDT with every month, so we have a lot of people in common with them, um, and that works pretty well. And actually, there are a lot of commonalities on there in terms of you know, psychology, OT, therapy, input with other chronic neurology. What do you call the team? What's it called? It's called community neurology team. And I think, I mean, we talked about social prescribing. I mean, I think it, it would be a nice study, actually, to do the use of social prescribing in MS. Because, I mean, I sent you some reviews about the social prescribing, and the evidence, actually, although there's this big rollout of the link workers, the evidence for social prescribing isn't very strong. I mean, the studies are quite small. and. Um, but actually, if we looked at it in MS, one of the concerns about it is, is does it actually cause inverse care? Um, well, there is evidence around health trainer services, which are a similar culture model. 67% mm. of people nationally who saw a health trainer change, had a behaviour change as a result. Yeah. Um, and they targeted at the most deprived communities in many, many areas. So in Bradford, it was totally in that bottom quintile. Yeah, Huge yeah. change. So that's what we would need to look at, is whether we could target the social prescribing to our disengaged or, you know. But there are other ways to do that, because there's a project, I can't remember if it's um, survival cancer or something else, they were trying to do recently before this last campaign. And what they did was they got busy affected women, they got them to talk to hairdressers. So yeah. when they were at hairdressers, they brought in this conversation about, and the, in, the uptake is really huge. So it's looking at how you can tap into other things. Yeah. And obviously, that could be another way of asking that question. How do you see your MS team? You know, so you it's, it's, it's talk about hairdressers, it made me think about podiatrists and getting pedicures. My observation over the years is the state of the feet is a very good indicator of social deprivation. And when you get those patients coming in and their foot care, and their foot hygiene is very, very poor, those patients tend to be in trouble. They just haven't got the 
uh, motivation, the energy, or the uh, physical capabilities of looking after their toenails and their feet. It's actually, a, a, I reckon we can capture social deprivation by just photographing their feet. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not joking. Really it's, 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 I'm not joking. It's really, really. What? Natural. Don't know that. So I think that these 8.5s with no hands, but their feet are perfectly manicured and they've been looked after. Yeah. So it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's it kind of integrates things in a way that allows you to look at it without asking the, the questions necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maria. How easy will it be to create like screening and annual screening of persons who are seeing the disease or by the community nurses in their communities and then that feeding back to the GPs and the GPs think that they've not been seen or they haven't been missed or follow up to the hospital uh, and refer back to the service. Yep. The thing about London because there's so many neuroscience centres, so let's say GP practice has got six patients, so there may be two in our centre, two in Queen Square and two in Neural Free. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. it's, um, whereas I suppose if you're working in True, or there is only one centimeter you can be linked to. True, is that correct? Well, yes. You can always go to Plymouth. We share. We share. Okay, so next steps is we'll go. To, um, I'll try and summarize. Helen, yeah. I'll try and summarize. Can you talk to this? No, because it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Okay. So, I mean, the next steps are um, I think we need, uh, we'll know who's. Long on to this, uh, we need help to make this happen. So uh, uh, I would imagine we would have to, have to formulate some tasks on this, if you don't mind. I see David shaking his head. The body label's not very good then. Who's willing to help on this? I mean, it means doing work. <laughs> so um, if anyone wants to do a, uh, a study on We'll put on the, on the, on the tablet, on the table, um, study of social prescribing. That's one thing. And so we're interested in that as well. I think we definitely need to create a system that can be rolled out across the country uh, for screening <coughs> to find people who are outside the system getting in and then to create a high risk register. And that high risk register is not just about its cognition, it's about uh, frailty, it's about unemployment, social deprivation. Food poverty, all those things can all be put into that screening tool. The question is, is how do you do that without upsetting the average MS patient that comes into your clinic? That's a really difficult question. That may get insulted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking about the cognition. So uh, I'm not quite sure if you have any experience with CANTAP test on tablet. It's from Cambridge. It's used mainly for trials because it's quite expensive, so it's not kind of available everywhere, but it's very simple. It's like really 10-15 minutes, the patient is playing with the tablet and uh, you get very clear result about memory and so on, and it's quite precise. I mean, it's validated in Cambridge. So if it would be kind of a way how to test the patients more routinely, I don't know. But the results look great. Uh, I mean, you yes, don't have to be a neurologist. And, uh, the MS psychology <laughs> team, by the other way, they've created their own thing called biocans mm. or the single digit modality test. But that, I think it's not necessarily mm. that's the solution. But I think maybe cognitive screening is mm. an important mm. issue. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but if I may, one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is really like even for GP. He does not have to know anything about neuropsychology and so on. He just gets a picture with scales where the patient is with memory, where, where the patient is with mood, and so on. So it's very interesting to screening. So <laughs> I guess the, what, the, mm. the difficulty is really, I guess what we want is something really simple that we can use across all of the MS centres and, mm. and, and in the community. So if MS nurses are going out to see people at home, that you know, it's something that's cheap and easy to mm. do in a way. Um, in terms of the screening, I really think that we need to learn from what people are doing already. So you were talking and you were talking about different kind of screening and using the Macmillan, you know, having a look at that so that one of the things maybe would be to design, I think, what you were saying, weren't you, about, you know, a template that we can all use that picks well, up. Maybe we should just do a literature review and you'll probably find this has been done in oncology. I mean, we just have to adopt it or adapt it. Yeah, yeah, but we look at the Macmillan one and, and okay. say how, how applicable is it, maybe 
you know, some of you could look at it and see what it looks like compared to what you use in your screening and what you think is actually, well, that's a bit, you know, irrelevant to MS and that actually would be really useful and obviously if it's been wide, used in a widespread way. Not clinician, so what, um, in Parkinson's, and yeah. it's kind of going to know that you can fix one percent and make a difference. Yeah. So um, there was a project in the states where they just added one question mm -hmm. to everyone who was linked into the thing. Like, so if you think of one question and got everyone in your community, the MS Academy, to add that to what they ask patients, would that be something you could do? Yeah. What's the question? Well, that their one question was. The, well, it was about wearing off of their drugs, yeah. but you could have the question of, are you smoking? Do you smoke? But, yeah. yeah. Are you or who are you living with? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see your feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, but yeah, it's not the maybe same. just having one yeah. question yeah. is a very quick, is a practical yeah. way that you could. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the British Geriatric Society has got a comprehensive geriatric assessment template that exists both within uh, two. two Prison G because the system name is the TPP that exists there. Right. And then your aspiration should be there is a comprehensive assessment of the system. Yeah. The TPP. So not that everyone would use it, but actually it's there perhaps look on from an aid memoir. There's not necessarily permission to the information. It could be the primary care navigator that work within the practice and get all the social stuff. Okay. So who's not prepared to participate in the piloting or something like this? I'm asking you a load of questions, but I went the other way, there was no hands. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, if you want to, don't be, put your hand up. So, I mean, we need to test this, and we're going to have to have test science. And, and it looks like just speaking to, if this is the motivated group to come here, I'm su I'll be surprised if we, when we go upstairs, we're going to get people um, putting their hands up when we ask about, you know, are they routinely screening for social work? I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. It's something that's been uh, under the radar. Okay, we've got five minutes to go. We have to go upstairs because David Rogg is absolutely adamant. He wants everybody to be in a picture. Okay. <laughs> so we uh, have to go upstairs now for the photo. For the photo. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We didn't need IT at all. We didn't use our slides. Thank you very much.